in Patagonia, he'd fished in Ireland, he'd fished in Scotland, Russia. He'd been everywhere. He's a wealthy yeah. guy, right? And he, he books trips with guides and he's fishing all these places. He was standing there, not instead of tying his fly on, he stood there holding his fly and his tippet out to me while I worked his friend's tangle. And uh, I said to him, I said, go ahead, you can go ahead and tie that on. He goes, well, I don't know how. I said, what? That was Stephen Bird telling another crazy fishing story. The Wet Fly Swing today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. I'm excited to share a second podcast we're launching that should be a huge help if you are an outdoor business or know somebody who has a business and wants to improve their online presence. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash online to get updated when the big show launches at the end of this month. Today, Stephen Bird, who runs the Soft Tackle Journal, describes how swinging flies for big red band trout in the upper Columbia uh, goes down up there. We hear a little insight into an area that has been under the radar but produces some of the best fly fishing if you're into swinging. And let's be honest here, who's not into swinging, right? Too much uh, to cover here or even uh, start to talk about it, so let's just jump into it. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. Since 1977, the Fly Fishing and Tying Journal has long been considered the Angler's Magazine. With original how-tos and technical articles written by the best trout and steelhead anglers in the West. They are committed to sharing exceptionally written essays, fiction, poetry, and in-depth guides to fly tying and fly fishing. FTJ is one of my go-to magazines, and if you haven't checked it out recently, you can get started today by calling 1-800-541-9498 or heading over to the web at ftjangler.com. GotFishing.com is your trusted source of information with access to the world's best fishing trips. You'll never pay a dime extra for the trip you book, and in many cases, less than advertised. Find out where GotFishing could take you by heading over to GotFishing.com today. That's G-O-T Fishing.com, or reach them by phone at 208-630-3373. GotFishing.com, the easiest place to start your next fishing adventure. Without further ado, here's Stephen Bird from the Soft Tackle Journal.com. How's it going, Stephen? Pretty good, Dave. Good, good. It's great to uh, great to have you on the show. We were kind of chatting off air about some some random random stuff there, uh, p- politics and everything, and conservation. We probably w- won't jump into a lot of that this this conversation. We have got a lot to cover as far as wet flies and Upper Columbia and stuff. But um, before we dig into what you do at the Soft Tackle Journal and swing the fly and things like that. Can you just talk about how you first got into fly fishing and how the soft tackle journal came to be? Right. Well, I started fishing. I grew up in Massachusetts partly and, uh, on a lake, my grandfather was a dyed in the wool Yankee fly fisherman. And, uh, at that time in the early fifties, spinning reels were just coming around and most people just started with a fly rod. So I started with a fly rod off the family dock using dough balls for bait. And uh, from there, I graduated to the local brooks using pink earthworms for bait and uh, fishing them on a fly rod. And from there, I graduated to flies. My grandfather gave me one of the fly books with uh, uh, snooded uh, gut leader flies. I think it was a Parmachine Bell and a mm-hmm. Silver Doctor and a couple of others. I started fishing those in the brook. and they were used up i wish i had saved them but at that time they were just gear to use up so hmm. that's how i started nice and when did you so move, I've always move out west? Out. i was in junior high school about seventh grade my dad moved us out to uh glendora in southern california which was uh shocking and uh But uh, luckily, I was right at the base of Azusa Canyon, was able to ride my bike up Azusa Canyon to the San Gabriel River, ride local, and uh, met a couple of gentlemen there who mentored me, a couple of uh, Japanese-American men who had actually been in internment camps, but didn't have any hard feelings. They saw I was a kid that needed to fly fish, and... Really, probably the methodology that I learned from them guys lasted me my whole life. 
they're very clean, zen clean fishermen. Uh, uh, they had a very natural, simple approach. And it's kind of stuck with me all my life since then. No kidding. And is that, to this day, how would you describe the type of fishing you do most of the time? Are you fairly specific on what you do? Mm, well, I live on the Columbia River, which is fairly specific and that the water kind of demands a six knot uh, surface speed on average. It demands a downstream approach. So when I moved here in the early 70s, I was actually fishing wet flies with the attritional, uh, traditional uh, uh, presentation, which is an upstream presentation like it presents a fly, and just keeping contact with the fly and watching the the line leader connection on the water to see if it pulled and made a little wake, which would indicate a fish stopped it. And that's the way we fished. Uh, nowadays, they call it Euro nymphing or high stick nymphing, but really it was just the way we fished before, uh, before bobbers. And uh, when I moved up here to the Columbia, I, the current with an upstream cast presentation would, would, kind of mess it up and it just it folded the water was just too conflicted for that so i had to switch over to more of a quartering approach where you cast out straight out at 90 degrees and then let the fly drift and swing so that's mainly the water where i live kind of demanded that i that i take a swing approach to fishing the wet flies hmm. and that's it and now and now the wet fly swing, the soft tackles, the the journal, you, you pretty much, yeah. I mean, can you talk a little bit about the soft tackle journal maybe before we jump into the Columbia in that area, just describe what the soft tackle journal from somebody who's never read it before? Well, it's just basically the soft tackle journal is just a place for me to, to play around. It's uh, pretty eclectic, but the main focus is uh, soft tackle flies, uh, uh, flies that embody uh, the elements of good soft tackle design. I think that uh, James Leisenring uh, laid down, which would be motion, obfuscation, and light. Uh, very simple flies. Uh, very few of them imitate exact insects, or but some do. I just wanted to do a blog where I could write and and I tie a lot of flies design a lot of flies and just show the flies and possibly get feedback from other guys that were into the wingless wets and uh, learn more about it you know and that has led to me learning more a lot of guys do feedback and, and since i've started it i've really learned a lot more about about the flies but basically that's what it's about is just wingless wet flies not strictly uh like i say there's a lot of esoteric material on there some of it doesn't even have anything to do with fly fishing interactive uh engagement principle marketing gateway to my guide site in other words if you go over in the right hand column there's a really obscure little photo you can click on and that leads you to my guide site but i don't really like to advertise i figure to it's better to give people something for their time so they can go to Soft Tackle Journal and read the things there to read. There's news, uh, flies to look at, the dressings are with the flies. Uh, and maybe they'll mess around on there and notice the, the gateway to my guide site over there in the right-hand column. And that's how I advertise rather than go to shows. Hmm. No kidding. So basically, so you guide up there on the Upper Columbia and – and you don't do any advertising other than a little uh, photo in the upper right column, which I've been to your site. I, yeah, I've never noticed it either. So that's the only way you currently get get uh, clients? Or word of mouth, I guess, is all probably another big thing. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. So in this day and age <laughs> where you see a lot of, you know, all sorts of different online promotional stuff, I mean, you're sitting out there just basically creating an amazing resource. If somebody wants to learn, so if I was brand new and never swung wet flies, had never done any of that before, and I was making my way, I heard about the Upper Columbia, about this amazing place up there, and I just drove up there on my own, 
could I just start reading a bunch of your articles and, and be prepared to uh, catch some fish on the wet fly swing? I would say yes, you'd be prepared to catch some fish, but if you arrived cold like that, you probably wouldn't know where to start or where to get access. And, you know, on, on my blog site, I, I do I write from the Columbia River, but I, I don't write about spots, right? I don't give directions to places to fish. I don't think that would be fair to my uh, – the reason I do it the way I do it is because I think there's a balance in that. I get the people who I th think need to come here. They're, they're seeking to come here. And they find this obscure gateway and they go through and then they come here. And that's the way I like to do it. Uh, rather than go to shows all around the country, spend $1,000, you know, and book a whole bunch of guys and run them like ponies down the river all summer. I don't think that's good for the fishery. I don't think it's good for anybody. So, but if anyone to answer your question, there was one guy that drove out here from Seattle, just did that, he came out here cold, and he uh, come up river from Northport and pulled out on a turnout that overlooked the river, and he looked at it for a while, got back in his truck, turned around, and drove back <laughs> to Seattle without ever wetting a line. Because, you know, average speed of six knots, very conflicted currents. It's not your classic trout stream at all. It would probably take him a year of camping out to, to, to get it. Yeah. So, it does take a while. So, so it is good. I want to learn to I want to learn the UC is to come up and go with a guide. Yeah, yeah. First. You talk about where to start, not knowing where to start. So if, if somebody did get a um, – well, let's just take that scenario where somebody doesn't get a guide. They're going up there. How would you – you know, how would you coach it? What would you tell them – like how do you catch fish? Can you describe – is it simply, like you said, cast out 90 degrees, throw on a wingless wet fly, find a little riff, riffle that maybe – it has a little lower water speeds and, and just start covering water? Right. Well, the fishing's really spotty. There's a lot of water there, and the fish are concentrated in certain areas, and then it's like the ocean, and then there's vast areas where there's, where there's no fish. So you, for one thing, you got to know where the concentrations are during their respective seasons. So then that matter would be hard Somebody would need to bring a boat if they were going to come cold. And then again, there's a problem because there's places in the river where it comes up really shallow and you could knock your prop off. A oh. uh, jet would be better. Oh, uh, On your guide trips, are you using a, a, a boat? I am. Uh, we have a uh, spay itinerary in the early spring, which is uh, uh, trout spay only. And we do that from the bank. And we're able to drive to the different runs where we, that we fish at that time, so we don't need a boat. Uh, again, in the fall, beginning the second week in September, during the October caddis hatch, we start a spay itinerary again. And that, again, we use the boat and we drive. We do a combination, but we're always swinging from the bank uh, when we do the spay itinerary. So sometimes from a boat, sometimes we drive, depending on – where the concentrations of fish are and how, how easy, what's the easiest way to access it. Only w during the warmer months when the fish are feeding in the upper water column, when there's a lot of stuff in the water coming down, the fish are in the upper water column. We have nightly uh, sedge hatches uh, through the warm months. They're reliable to fish over with soft tackles. Maybe that's something you could do here for, for us is take us in a day in the life of like a, the, the year of that area up there. Can you, you know, right now it's almost, it's almost April. Can you just start right now and talk about, you know, the different hatches and, and where, what you'd be fishing throughout the different seasons? Well, right now we're in the pre-spawn. Most of the, our fish here are the native red band rainbows and they spawn in April and May. That's about the peak of the spawn. Maybe some sooner that overlaps some a little in the earlier part of June, but mostly April and May our fish are spawning. And, uh, I don't like to mess with them too much when they're spawning. Right now in the pre-spawn, uh, I'm swinging deep, deep with a sink tip. I'm using a ten foot, uh, eight to nine inch per second 
sink tip on a uh, uh, Scandi type line. It's, it's actually, I'm using a Rage Compact, yep. which is like a hybrid between a Scandi and a Scat. About 14 foot seven weight is what I like here. That's another thing about the Columbia. A lot of people, when they think trout spay, you know, they're thinking very light rods. I'd probably, I mean, number four is probably the most popular model in trout spay. The guys are using threes and fours. But uh, here, you want to match the rod to the river and the, and the fish. So we got big water. A lot of the larger fish are further out. Uh, you want to be able to reach him. Uh, fish, it's very common to catch fish over 24 inches here. Hmm. Every year we catch fish over 30 inches. Uh, really? The largest yeah. trout I've caught out of was 15 pounds. So we have big fish. These so are steelhead. There's no, well, they're landlocked steelhead. They were steelhead, but they see we're above the Grand Coulee Dam. So. Oh. What's interesting and sad, though, is uh, thousands of them go down and beat themselves, the par, go down and beat themselves to death against the Grand Coulee Dam trying no to get kidding. to the ocean. However, they know from genetic testing now that uh, you'll have a sampling from the same nest where some of them are, are just home guard fish that, that stay upriver all the time, a large percentage of them, and there's still a percentage of them that want to go anadromous so huh. that keeps them all from getting wiped out so we lose a lot of fish that just go down and beat themselves against the dam and that's never going to change because they still got that the dams ever went down though they'd start going to the ocean again and we would have steelhead fishing here is a lot like steelheading it's kind of like a cross between steelheading and trouting uh like right now our fish are like steelhead they're in the pre-spawn mode uh they like the same color lures that steelhead like, you know, flies with a lot of red in them, inks, blues, uh, egg color, fish are egg minded. So eggy colors work really good here right now. Uh, we're swinging streamers, mostly red. Uh, anything that's got red in it. Been doing really good lately on a thing called a red demon, which is kind of a D style fly in number two. Huh. With a red tinsel body, so, uh, anything with red in it, right, seems to work really well here in the pre-spawn. So right now, we're not fishing insect imitations. We're fishing lures, attractor flies, uh, streamers, you know, in bright colors as you would for steelhead. Uh, classic steelhead and salmon patterns work really good here this time of year. Hmm. What's a What's a, I mean, you're painting an amazing picture. Uh, I mean, I, you know, what's a good day? Steelheading, you know, obviously you can have <laughs> some days that are really good, some days where you might not even get a fish. How, what, what's a really good day and what's a really uh, bad day there for, for the fishing during the peak? Well, like anywhere, it can be fickle. Like, uh, uh, for example, Yes, I've been fishing too. My wife keeps me working around the house, so I get out for a couple hours every day. All I have to do is walk across the road. We're right on the river. But uh, yesterday I went and fished for a couple hours, had one non-committal grab. Now, three days prior to that, I was fishing two-hour sessions and getting one or two fish each session, yeah. which I would say was was average. I would say that was average. Uh these fish were all in the 19 to 24 inch class. So that was like, that'd be pretty good steelhead fishing. Yep. Uh, That's it. That's so, it. So, and they were probably, you know, I'd say they're like average Oregon steelhead, right? So yeah. to get two in a two hour session, I had a few nights ago, I had two 24 inch fish in a two hour session and a couple grabs as well. That's so. It. That's a it, couple so hours, that's not bad. Yeah, we had a weather change yesterday. The pressure dropped, and I went out, and, it, you know, it felt changey and dead. I didn't see any birds in the sky. And uh, like I said, I got one half-ass grab and non-committal, and that was it. You know, it yeah. just shut off. But, but they'll any any excuse they have, they will shut off. What, what shuts them off mainly? Is it a 
uh, you know, water temperature, is that kind of the main thing that changes or water levels? I guess you're, yeah, it's pretty big water. This time of year, you're getting some higher water, but summertime, does it drop pretty low? We're a tail water. So the, oh, right. the temperature remains in the, in the good range pretty much year round. But right now is low water fall through spring until spring runoff is low water. Uh, then runoff, we all run off from, Oh, May, sometimes into July is pretty high water. But that doesn't really affect the fishing. Uh, during the high water period is we're getting when we're getting the most insect catches. So you're fishing, <clears throat> you're fishing, you mentioned kind of some of the spay flies and the red stuff. So when, do you, when does that start changing throughout, you know, after this time to where you're fishing? Are you, are you then fishing trout type of flies in the summer? Oh, yes. Generally now, see, as we transition into may uh the stone flies start to get active on the bottom there's there's some squala around right now but they just don't seem to be one that really gets them going here uh the large salmon fly uh nymphs get them going in may so we'll swing i'll swing like through the month of may i'll swing a number two uh black uh pats rubber legs that's all you need. Uh, just weight it under the body, let it on the shank, and uh, that works really good. Uh, Mid April into May, uh, towards the end of May, early June, first week in June, the gram starts to show up. Uh, it's a worthwhile hatch to fish over. As the grams get going, we get some March Browns mixed in with them, so uh, you could fish. Uh, just a uh, olive-bodied soft tackle with a little uh, ear thorax on it to cover the granums, uh, to a regular hare's ear pheasant tail soft tackle, cover the March browns, and you can swing that stuff in late May, early June, in the late afternoons. Uh, works really well. And then Transitioning into the early part of June, you still have the granums and the March browns, blue-winged olives on cloudy days all the time. Uh, they do bring up some fish. Uh, if you see, I don't fish over the, the olives unless I see signs of fish on them. A lot of times you'll see big hatches of them, and there's just nothing there feeding on them. But anyway, that... Towards the end of June now, the spotted sedge starts to come on. Uh, they look a lot like granum, slightly bigger. They're number 14. The nymph is a 12. Uh, so you can tie your soft tackles in a size 12 or tie them sparse on a tw number 12 hook. That holds the bigger fish better. Uh, that starts about the second week of June, comes on really, really big hard a lot of insects blizzard hatch i hate to use the word but it really is and that really gets them up and going on the surface so that's a really worthwhile one the last week of june that lasts through to the end of august that's going on daily of course that gets eclipsed by the larger mayfly hatches that come on but the last week of june first week of july we start to see the big red drakes which is a subspecies of green drake, but it's all mahogany with a, with a slate gray wing. Uh, Dave Hughes and, uh, came to fish with me last summer, and, uh, and Rick Hafel, the entomologist, and we were trying to identify this thing. And uh, that's finally, Rick was able to identify it as a, as a green drake. There's actually no green in it. It's hmm. totally mahogany, both the nymph and the adult. So that's our big mayfly hatch here. And that goes from about the last week of June through the third week of July. And uh, that's when we switch to dry flies. The fish will take that dry fly of uh, that one all day long. They're, you don't really see big hatches of them. They're more of a seasonal presence. You see them on the water every evening. But uh, they're always around. And the fish will take the imitation through that period. Uh, August, now moving on into August. Get some fish up and going in the evening. It's the dog days. It's just hubcap right here. The fish here are very light sensitive. Uh, so uh, 
towards the end of August, right up against dark. You can get some fish on the small soft tackles in the evenings. Uh, usually I'll go somewhere else and go to the coast and fish for salmon or something in August. But then, then about the first week, sometimes as late as right at the end of early as right at the end of August, uh, We'll start to see October caddis. Most years, though, they're after the first week of September, you start to see them. And that's that's my favorite time of year this year. The water's getting low again. A lot of good swinging water starting to shape up. And that October haddis, caddis hatch lasts from, oh, the first week in September into November. So it's quite a long period. And, uh, Again, you don't see big hatches of them. They're just always around. They're a presence through the season, and the fish take the invitation. Uh, uh, both dry and wet versions all the way through the period. It's a great period for swinging wet flies because the uh, the insect uh, really lends itself well to uh, wet fly imitation, big soft tackles. It's a nice, healthy uh, number six bug. Uh, so it brings up a lot of big fish. So that's, that's my favorite time of year to fish it. And that's, that's pretty much how it goes through the season. Mm, that's anyway, awesome. I just laid it down. That's awesome. And that's, oh. a, as you were talking there, I was just thinking, okay, if I was going to ask you with the, with the bet, what I should come up there to fish. It sounds like, uh, that fall hitting it in early September for swinging up and you're talking just swinging dry lines, just like you're fishing for some, I mean, so they are summer steelhead essentially, right. With, with a big, like a October caddis. It's great because you can just fish a straight floating line and a long leader and, uh, October caddis imitation and just, just swing away. They really like that bug on the with a swung presentation too. It really, uh, I think the swung presentation you know really imitates the uh, the uh, the way the uh, natural moves and yeah. comes up. So you know, orange can be a good color, especially in the fall. Is that yeah? I mean, you got a lot of those October caddis, but orange is just kind of more of a natural, buggier looking color than say a, a red, right? You're, you're, are you fishing any reds in the fall? Uh, nope, just fishing uh, like that burnt orange uh, October caddis imitations. If you go to Soft Tackle Journal, and there's a search bar there, too, for what's on there, there's a lot of October caddis imitations uh, on there that you can look at. Oh, so cool. if you want to have a look at what we're swinging, go to Soft Tackle Journal, and you can see a lot of them. Perfect. Perfect. I'll put a... I'll put a link in the show notes to, to uh, some of those flies. And I also want to check in, you know, we talked a little bit, I guess you've been mentioning a little bit about fly design, but I had a note here on, um, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but a, a neoclassicist uh, to, to fly design. Can you describe what that is first, <laughs> what that is first, and then what your your take is on fly design for these wet flies that we're talking about? <laughs> yeah, somebody interviewed me once and they called me that, so I don't know. I guess it's, I guess it's cause they kind of, you know, I, I, I don't ha have anything against like shake flies, uh, mini intruders and all that kind of stuff. But I just mainly, you know, I fish on, uh, you know, standard hooks. Uh, sometimes I'll tie short on the hook, but I guess my, my flies kind of reflect, uh, more of an old timey design frames, you know? Yeah. You're old school, but you're not too old school. I had, uh, you know, you mentioned at the start, the, the casting upstream, the wet flies. Um, I had Davey Watton on way back in an early episode, and he described that old school, really the old traditional class. But you don't, I mean, you're more just swinging. You're, this is like steelhead fit. I mean, you're you're just fishing for summer steelhead, and you got, uh, you're fishing with bugs. You're just fishing with, I mean, it sounds. Yeah, if you were going to actually, you know, if you were going to cross steelhead fishing with trout fishing you would have trout spay on the on the upper columbia yeah that's what's happening here just on the upper Columbia, can you just try like where you're at what's the closest town and then also what the the two dams are above you and below you you mentioned one of them right well the the first dam below us would be uh grand coulee and then below grand coulee is chief joseph and fish can't come over either of those dams and then above us let's see the ponderay river comes in I, I live a mile from the Canadian border, oh, south wow. of the border. And uh, 
Hungary enters the Columbia at right at the border, a mile up the road from us here. And it's carrying half the water that's going by us here. So above the Ponderé, you go two miles up river from me, up into Bruce Crook country, up there by Trail BC, uh, the river's half the size that is as it is out here in front of me. Jeez. So there's quite a bit of character. It's more of a classic trout stream up there on steroids, and I love to fish up there. That's where I do most of my swinging, actually, is on the Canadian side. Huh. But uh, the Ponderé is bringing in training the, you know, the flathead and all those rivers, you know, off of the uh, west slope there. So it's bringing a lot of water in. So the dam, there's a dam right on the Ponderé right before it enters the Columbia. That would be the, the Ponderé Dam. And then uh, above that, you have uh, 30 miles of river up to uh, Hugh Keenly Side Dam, which is just above Castlegar, B.C., Right at Castlegar, you have the Kootenai River coming oh. in and enters the Columbia. We're on we're on a pretty truncated section of river, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot of water. There's enough drainage and spawning for these fish that used to be steelhead to keep going in it and still be steelhead like. I, lo- I love it because it's definitely a, a place that I know it's for some reason hasn't been known as much to the world, you know, everybody thinks of Montana and all the amazing stuff and Kelly Gallup and, you know, <laughs> but, oh. you know, you got this little thing tucked up there between these two dams, which sounds like a gold mine for, uh, for sweet trout spay and everything. So it's pretty exciting to hear that it's not too far. And I mean, you're up there near Canada, so it's a little bit of dry, but what's, what's the biggest town, the nearest big town to you? Nearest big town would be Colville, Washington, which is like 35 miles south of us. That's the reason why the Columbia has remained what they call the biggest secret in fly fishing is we're we're 200 miles away from the nearest freeway in Spokane. And uh, if you look on a map of the Columbia River, it shows Lake Roosevelt going all the way to the Canadian border. So people think there's a lake here. But actually, the cartographers made a mistake because we have – in the, in the state side, we have approximately 20 miles of river before it gets down into Lake Roosevelt proper, where it turns lacustrine. But uh, it, right before it enters Lake Roosevelt, it squeezes through a real narrow gorge that drops in elevation very quickly. It's called the Little Dalles. And above the Little Dalles to the Canadian border is what we call the American reach or the old maps fur trade maps it was called the american reach mm-hmm. where we are and it's probably the it's you hear the hanford reach which is supposedly a, a, a free-flowing stretch like the original river as being the only reach left but it's actually not true the american reach from the border to the little dalles is pretty much as it was before the dams so we have Unlike the lake, we have a very healthy uh, ecosystem, a lot of insect life uh, to support the trout. Ah. Uh, so it's, really it's kind amazing. of unique. It's a gem, really. It's taken us years, years to try to get the state, you know, and uh, different stewardship agencies on board to what we have here. We weren't even able to convince Washington Fish and Wildlife until about five years ago that these were even native trout that we even had here. They, uh, <laughs> they had old information from after from a survey taken five years after, I think back in the mid forties, uh, that, that where the guy said there was no, no trout left. And they've been going off that info for years. And, uh, you know, I, I asked the biologist, I says, well, what are these trout we've been catching then? <laughs> and, uh, Wow. <laughs> now we're seeing spawning up the creek. Yeah. And uh, well, those are the progeny of uh, yep. uh, stock fish they put in Lake Roosevelt. And then finally, a few years ago, they did the Canadians did a genetic study, and uh, and we did too, and came to the, the conclusion that actually the uh, rainbows that they'd introduced into Lake Roosevelt never did take. Nope. Actually, it was the Colville tribes that 
that uh, really got behind that and are making sure now that uh, we're not getting non-native trout introduced into the system and, and doing what they can to uh, you know to keep our fish spawning a lot, a lot of them spawn up the San Poil River on the uh, Colville Reservation. So, but anyway, besides the American reach, then above the border we have another. You know, we have another 25 miles or so of the same thing, just free-flowing river with a, you know, with a healthy uh, ecosystem. Altogether, there's about 40, 45 miles of, uh, of this, what we have here, that our trout water, native trout water. So that's, you know, it's not a very, that's not very big. That's not a very long river, but there's really not a lot. You know, look at like, you know, 15 miles on the American side, and a lot of that is, very, very hard to access or doesn't have fish in it. And the surveys indicate we have about 700 mature fish per mile. And now a quick word from our sponsors. Gotfishing.com, a boutique booking agency for fishing adventures around the world. Gotfishing is unique in working with a small hand-selected group of outfitters from around the world that are known for providing an experience that is second to none. Got Fishing can be your trusted source of information with access to the world's best fishing trips. Their sole purpose is to help you plan the most authentic fishing venture while making sure it fits within your budget. The beauty is that everything they do is 100% free. You will never pay a dime extra for your trip, and in many cases, less than advertised. I can attest personally to the service that Got Fishing provides as they have been working with me closely to set my first trip to the Yucatan for saltwater. They have taken care of all the important details and allowed me to avoid worrying about any of the complications. I know Brian and the crew have you covered at Got Fishing. Whether you need a fishing consultant, travel consultant, gear pro, or the like, they have you covered. With top-of-the-line outfitters they represent around the world, they are confident they have just the right trip for you. You can give them a call at 208-630-3373 or head over to gotfishing.com to get started today. Let Got Fishing help you plan the fishing trip you've been dreaming about. Because at Got Fishing, there is nothing we won't do so you don't have to. That's gotfishing.com. FTJ Spring Edition is packed with the best fly tying instruction, fly fishing techniques, destination articles, and fly fishing stories. Here are a few of the featured fly tires in the spring edition of the Fly Fishing and Tying Journal. Master fly tire Dave McNeese begins his multi-part tutorial on the secrets of dyeing your own materials. I know this is a hot topic because I've been uh, hearing about it from some of the listeners of the podcast, so this is going to be a big one. This is going to be super helpful. Uh, we find out also how to tie big durable flies for predator uh, predatory fish, an effective uh, cicada pattern, and we hear about a 14-year-old uh, fly tire who's who's kicking some butt out there, uh, lining up sponsors and ambassadors. So we're, we get to hear that story in the uh, in the spring edition. Also, Gary Lewis gives us a little rundown on Diamond Lake as he heads out there, and we're also going to be heading to San Diego with Joe Warren, who talks about tuna, dorado, wahoo, and more. Dave Hughes provides a tribute to Frank Amato in, in the, dish, the spring edition, and we get an update on the short story contest. Lots of additional content in this one, so uh, head over to ftjangler.com and subscribe so you don't miss any of the tips, tricks, and stories in the next issue. That's ftjangler.com to get started today. There are many other guides up there guiding? There is. There's other, there's other outfits up here in the, in the warmer months. So it's lately in recent years, it's been guiding pretty heavy. Are you guiding with uh, the uh, Jack Mitchell and the Evening Hatch crew and all that stuff? No, I'm guiding on my own. Uh, I do sub for them sometimes. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, we. Uh, I did a trip with Jack here earlier this year, and uh, for Steelhead and. Yeah, I've been chatting. He was actually one of my early guests I had on. Uh, we talked about the uh, the click attack and <clears throat> some of this stuff. I didn't even know he mentioned it, but we didn't even. I didn't realize that he was even guiding up far, you know, that high up there. Which is, yeah, which is definitely. It sounds like it's cool to finally get you on and hear hear the story um, about it. What about you know we we were t- we touched on fly design. Can you go back to that and talk about? I mean, you you noted a little bit, but what what is what is your fly design? You know, what when you hear that. What do you think of, or how do you design your flies? Uh, I think no matter where you live, if you're designing flies and you have a lot of water that you fish a lot, 
you're going to be informed by that water and it's going to inform what kind of fly designs you come up with. You know, we, we designed from basic frames, right? So, but then we build on those frames, different colors, different materials, whatever, you know, like your basic soft tackle spider is the same profile, right? Basically. And, you know, you just mix and match different types of materials to get different color combinations to do different things. Mm-hmm. But, uh, the simplicity of it is the frame, though, is like, well, you look at a natural insect or, or, or a minnow. They're not very complicated. You know, the minnow is an elongated teardrop shape. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the profile of, of, a, of a soft hackle spider is very simple. You know, and I think that really size and profile are the main thing, you know, in a fly with color, a distant third but uh, you know, those are very simple frames to work with, really. You know, if you take your basic streamer shape or your basic uh, yeah. spider shape, a guy could carry a selection of uh, hare's air nips, uh, gray hackle peacock, uh, pheasant tail, right? Carry those three. Uh, maybe a uh, partridge in yellow, uh, partridge in orange, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe those five flies. You probably do as better, better or you know as good as anybody just fishing those flies because you're gonna you don't have to worry about selection too much. There's not very many choices to make. Yeah, and, you know you're gonna you're gonna do all right. You know it's just a very basic you know way of looking at it. How the the, the ones that are proven you know and proven trout uh, materials you know peacock yeah. earl uh, partridge. Uh, you're going to be able to cover a lot of things. Those are going to stimulate a lot of things uh, tied in, you know, just a, you know, three or four different sizes. Or don't tie, don't buy hooks any smaller than number 14 and just tie down to uh, number 18 on your number 14 hook. I mean, if you had to pick just two flies for, say, one for fall, one for for that springtime swinging, what what would those two be? Well, if you live in the Northwest or in the West, anywhere where October caddis occur, I would say for fall, an October caddis. A fly for spring, uh, for to cover everywhere, if it travels well. Yeah. Uh, I would say uh, a Zulu or a, uh, some version of a Royal Coachman mm-hmm. wet fly, a hair wing Coachman, or a Coachman Tides D style. Yep. For the spring and for the summer, uh, all purpose in the summer, if I could only have one, hmm, probably a uh, partridge and peacock or okay. a uh, partridge hairs there. Yep. I could only have one. That's it. That's it. Yeah, those are great. Definitely, I love the partridge and uh, oh, peacock hairs your <laughs> partridge. Those are. Yeah, I'll take those three materials anytime for anything. Oh, you could actually use those materials, you know, and tie as large as a number four, you know, with your uh, and you've got a you've got a, a trout spay fly, you know, that'll that'll uh, work both as a lure and something to simulate living things. Yeah, know. let's uh and and keep it on that two twenty two. So, what about two tips? So, we're talking, you know, trout spay here, kind of it's like a mix between trout spay, summer steelhead swing what would be two tips you would give somebody that's heading up to that area my tip to anybody coming here would be to make sure you come knowing the basics i know that's going to sound redundant to some people Mm -hmm. i can tell you luckily last summer i had a guy who'd fished in patagonia he'd fished in ireland he'd fished in scotland russia been everywhere as a guy right and he, he books trips with guides and he's fishing all these places well him and his friend got tangled and i was I had to clip his fly off to fix his tangle and i was fixing his friends and uh he was standing there not he, instead of tying his fly on he stood there holding his fly and his tippet out to me while i worked his friend's tangle and uh i said to him i said go ahead you can go ahead and tie that on he goes well, I don't know how. Ah. I said, what? I said, fishing all those places and you don't know how to tie your fly on? He says, well, the guide always does it. No way. 
Uh, you got the guy that comes, he's got a thousand dollar rod, and you watch him, he's going to, he, this guy doesn't know how to tie his fly on. And you look, and he's tying it onto an old tippet that, you know, that he'd wound off his, his reel there. It looks like a spring, you know, that, yeah. he, that, that he'd had <laughs> on there last year, right? <laughs> Let's flip that off and tie on a nice new straight piece of tippet material for it. Yeah. You know, so that's, you know, just doing the basics, uh, wow. common sense. Uh, know the basics so you can take care of yourself. Uh, you know, they're trout, they're, they're line shy. Uh, I see guys do things like they'll make a cast, right? But they, don't, they didn't think it went far enough or they don't like where they put it. And they'll rip it off the water and replace it for three inches difference, right? I would say never do that. Fish that one out, you know. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, the trout lateral line is a highly developed bullshit meter preset on till. You know, <laughs> it, it senses your presence. You're picking that cast up off the water and replacing it just to gain three inches. You just blew whatever was there. Yep. You know, if it didn't fall where you wanted it to fall. Yeah. Fish it out. Wait till it gets out of the lane before you pick it up again, right? Uh, just basic, you know, common sense skills. Uh, you know, don't shout out to your friends. You know, uh, don't be a presence because they'll, the fish within the in the area will sense you're there. Uh, they'll just, you know, they just they just know it's like a radar. So I would say, you know, my my tip would be to slow down and observe and. Uh, you know, become like a heron, not an over-caffeinated flamingo, right? <laughs> Go at it. Other than your old, your own stuff, obviously, your you know the Soft Tackle Journal is great. Um, you mentioned another the magazine, Swing the Fly. Any other resources you had mentioned for people that want to learn about you know this type of fishing, swinging flies for trout? A good resource if you're interested in the old time flies. There's some good resources on uh, Facebook yeah. as well. Uh, but uh, a, a really good one is Flint Forum. Oh, cool! And that's there's there's so much stuff archived there. You could you could walk through the archives for days. Uh, you could go down the list of uh, some of the best soft tackle tires around, hang out there and post there. And like I say, the information that's uh, archived there is is probably the greatest archive of uh, soft tackle. Spiders, traditional spiders uh, around the Flint Forum. Mm -hmm. Check that one out. Nice. I was going to ask uh, if Dave Hughes, who came up with the Flimp, uh, or the the am I saying yeah the the Flimp, who originally coined that term? That would be Vernon Vernon Pete Heidi. He was uh, friends with Jim Leisenring. He is the guy that persuaded Leisenring to write his book, Art of the Wet Fly, originally. And then Heidi, Heidi re redid the book. I think it was about 1970 uh, with some addendums. So that was long. I think Leisenring died in 1951 or 1952. But uh, Pete re-edited the book and added some more stuff to it and re-released it, I think, in about 1970. But he's the guy that coined the term uh, flint. But they didn't have the word emerger at the time. So mm. I think emerger is probably more understandable for folks than, than flint, which is yeah. phonetically a little awkward, but kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a mix between. So flint, I mean, obviously the nymph, but what's the, fl the, the, uh, the F part of it? Fly. Oh, it is. <laughs> so just that's fly. why it's kind of ambiguous, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah a cross between a fly. It's actually a nymph on its way to becoming a fly, oh, right? I see. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically sort of merger. Uh, the soft tackle flies work really great. That's that's really their uh, their their best usage is, is fishing over a hatch. You know, where you actually have uh, nymphs or pupa coming up huh. to uh, emerge into adults. All the early English spiders, the Yorkshire spiders, they didn't even know that the, at the time, in the old days, they didn't know those insects came from the water. Sure. They thought they just fell on the water. So <laughs> the imitators, they all imitated the adult. 
it was uh, Skews, GEM Skews, who, who who started to write about the fact that uh, these mayflies and stuff they were fishing over were actually waterborne and came from nymphs in the water. And uh, James Leisenring and the Americans picked up on that. There you go. So, and then, then Heidi coined the phrase to describe a, a nymph uh, rising from the bottom and transitioning into an adult which we now call an emerger, right? Yep. So. Yep. That's awesome. That's so awesome. the soft tackle fly basically works the best in situations where you have an emergence. Uh, it's like with the sedges here, uh, once in a while I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get a deeply hooked fish and, and, and have to keep it and I'll cut it open and check the stomach contents and, uh, I happened to check the stomach contents of one I got during the heavy sedge hatch, and the thing was stuffed chock-a-block full with pupa, and I didn't find one winged adult inside it, although there was winged adults all over the water. Wow. So the the conclusion I came to is the wings aren't digestible, so what they do is, and and the pupa is more available to them, They'll eat the pupa. This was like in the earlier part of the season. And then I noticed that later in the season, as the number of pupa, the hatches start to diminish, but there's more adults around. The the adult sedges, caddis will live, you know, a couple of weeks actually before they die. And so they're around and they accumulate towards the end of the hatch period. So as you get to a point where there's fewer pupa rising in the evening, the pupa, the emergence and the egg laying flights are simultaneous. But uh, when you get to that time when there's fewer pupa, but there's more adults available, they'll switch to the adults. So I found that the uh, the dry fly works better later in the period when there's more adults available than there are pupa. But, uh, but then again, uh, you can tie your, if you're going to fish wet, tie your soft tackles to imitate the uh, adult and uh it'll look it'll fish as a drowned adult or you could even grease it and, and fish it as a dry even so, so you know they function for uh all all different phases of the, of the hatch that's perfect that's perfect what you know as we start to think about kind of uh, wrapping this thing uh up a little bit here i just thinking you know, more generally on the Columbia, that upper Columbia, what, what what makes it unique? I mean, obviously it's a big river. It sounds like, you know, you're swinging flies. Is there anything when you, you know, some, for somebody, again, who hasn't been there, when they just set themselves up there, when they look around, what, what are they seeing? Well, they're seeing a big river. It's the third largest river in the U.S. after the uh, Mississippi and the uh, St. Lawrence. But uh, so you're seeing some big water on the American side, particularly. Like I say, on the B.C. side, it's a little more. Mm-hmm. normal but uh so it's intimidating because of its size uh on the american side so that, that's what you're going to see is this big water it's a big uh race uh mainly but it breaks down uh you look along the banks you know you get a lot of bank structure little points on the river that create you know uh, seams so that's where the fit, most of the fish are going to be concentrated. So it really breaks down uh, to the edges. You get on the edge of it, and you fish it just like any other stream. You know, anywhere you have an anomaly or structure that's breaking the water and breaking the current or whatever, fish are going to concentrate in there and the insects as well. And what and those structures are again? Can you remind me again what those structures? Those are just from natural structures along the bank. Yeah, yeah. What the the bottom here is composed mostly of. Uh, rounded glacial till uh you know we had the missoula flood came down through here and it tumbled the rocks and uh brought down a lot of stuff so mainly the bottom is composed of oh, skull-sized round rocks uh everywhere you go uh what kind of makes it unique is it creates a, a bottom substrate that uh, it's really easy for sculpins and insects to hide in hmm. So our trout tend to feed uh, more often up in the water column. Uh, this, I think that it's, it's just as easy for them to find stuff, especially in the warmer months that's coming down than to try to dig stuff that's hiding out of that substrate in the bottom. 
that's another thing where it makes it kind of unique too here. It's like the Canadians all fish floating lines year round. Uh, and, uh, you know, the trout used to looking up, they'll come up for the fly. Uh, so if you use a tip here or, or a fly with a dumbbell head or a cone head on it, uh, it gets down low and it's going to get right into those interstices between those round rocks and, uh, and die quick. So mostly what we're fishing here is uh, unweighted flies or flies weighted on the shank that will just tickle along above that bottom rather than get down in it. So you, you'll just lose that stuff and the way the bottom is, shapes up here. So. Gotcha. What are you using for leaders? Uh, what, what's your, is your leader about the same throughout the year, size, length, and are you, are you building a custom leader? I'm fishing a floating line. I'll, I fish a 15 to 20 foot leader with a full floating line. Uh, if I'm fishing a tip, I'll fish a six foot leader. Yeah. So you, you look at my leader, my floating leader is comprised of a, if it's a wet fly leader, I've got, uh, I'll start with five feet of, uh, 20 pound test nail knotted to my tying tip or to my line. Uh, and then another five foot section of, uh, 15 pound test. And then another five foot section of 12 pound test to that. And then I'll put a tippet ring onto that section and then add whatever tippet to the, the ring. So the tippet I might be using anywhere from six pound test to 12 pound test, depending on, on what I'm fishing. Mm-hmm. And then for the first I sink leader that I'm going to use on a tip, I'll use a uh, two and a half foot section or three foot section of 20 nail knotted to my tip and then a tippet ring on that and then whatever the rest of it to make a six foot leader tied to the tippet ring. What type of leader do you like to use? Right now, my favorite is uh, Seaguar Red Label Fluoro. It's the best. You can get it at any Walmart. It's the best fluoro I've, I've, I've used yet that I've tried yet. I hate to plug them. Like, they should uh-huh. send me some free stuff. You know, again, as we kind of wrap this up, it kind of brings me back, you know, where we started the, the, the journal that, you know, you write for the Soft Talco Journal. I mean, why do you – it sounds like you do get some leads from that for your business, but not many. You know, why do you continue to write in that journal? What, what's your main focus? Because eventually – um, you know, I mean, it sounds like, I don't know how many blog posts do you, do you know how many blog? Well, maybe first answer that. Why do you do what you do? I just like to write. It gets about 200 readers a day on average, according to the reader meter there. So, uh, I figure, well, there's that many guys reading it every day, you know, I might as well just keep doing it because it's, uh, I just like to write basically. And I like to look at the thing when it's done, kind of like looking at a magazine page. It was basically just to do art, really. I think that breaks down to that. And, and the art functions as a gateway to my guide site. What goes into editing after you write something? Yeah, all right. Yeah, well, edits the whole thing, really, right? Uh, editing is writing. That's the crafting part of it, right? The writing part of it all happens in your head. You Writing is just uh, recording thought, right? So. I'm going to write something. I'll think about it for a while till I got the arc down beginning, middle and end. Right. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when I thought the thing completely out, then I'll just write a rough draft out real hot and quick. Right. And then I'll just let that cool for you know, on a blog. That's what I'll, I'll let that cool overnight or whatever. And then I'll go back and read through it and uh, edit it, edit it, you know, polish it up. I don't, do that as much on the blog as I do for something I'm going to submit to Sling the Fly or any of the other magazines I write for or or a fiction or a poem or whatever. I'll edit those, read them a hundred times, you know, edit with a pencil in my hand. But uh, the blogs I'll usually read through three times while editing, you know, Mm -hmm. know, before I put them up. Gotcha. But, But yeah, editing is definitely necessary. Yep, yep. Okay. That's the difference between just pouring something out there or, and making something, you know, that's, that, that when, you know, people see that when they read it, they can see you put some time into it and, and they, 
they enjoy it. I like Paul Brun uh, from Jackson Hole. He's a great outdoor writer. And he, when you read him, he meanders. You feel like you're on a drift boat going down a river because he almost goes on a tangent, but not quite. And then he just swings right back in, right? I wish I could write like that. I talk, I talk like that probably, but uh, I tend to have to put my, put my thoughts together in a little bit more linear manner when I write. So I think if you read me, you won't, won't find a lot of uh, it's definitely not like beat writing or a uh, you know, stream of consciousness. I don't. I really don't do stream of consciousness. Yeah. When I write, somebody ever called me an elitist once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, still, I'm, still, I'm still I'm still going to the outhouse. Right. When I get indoor plumbing here at the place, man, I'll be, then I'll be an elitist. Oh, that's amazing. You guys, you guys don't have indoor plumbing at your house. No, you know, 7% of the households in America don't still have outhouses. Really? So how does the, how does the outhouse, so the, is that outhouse a, I mean, just in a hole or you got to set, how's that work with the outhouse? How do you clean and all that stuff? Or you just bury the hole? We have the original outhouse, which is really nice. It's homemade and it's a really deep hole with two fifty-five gallon drums stack, stacked up in it, right? And they got holes punched in them so they can drain out through. And heck, man, they've been going for years. You know, I just uh, squirt water down in there every now and then to keep it working, and it just composts and just drains okay. out through the holes. Real sandy soil here. With oh. work. So that works really good. Yeah, you don't have to put any cedar shakes or anything in there to mix it like those. Comp- no, uh-uh. not at all. Oh, good. So we do have a blue room. It's not made out of plastic. So we do have a plastic one for those who'd prefer that. Right, like they put on job sites. Oh, gotcha. It's yeah, a yeah. blue one. We call it the blue room. The bl- <laughs> that blue room, awesome. That's perfect. That's perfect. If you look back at your, I'm not sure where you were when you were uh, 20, 25 in that range, but if you look back at your, you know, your 20 year old self, it, would, what advice would you give to that person now that looking back from what you've, your life you've had? I'd probably say quit smoking, Steve. <laughs> That was going to be my next question. Before it's too late, and you're you're so hooked. That that was going to be my next (laughs) my next question. I was going to ask you what your uh, what some of your biggest vices are you you've had in your life, other than smoking. Other than smoking, what any other vices? I think just the normal ones. You know, actually, I'd never been a druggie. I'd never been a druggie. There you go. Uh, So that's good. I think. I think they should stop the war on drugs, though. And so, you know, anybody that you know, instead of getting arrested and put in jail and their lives ruined, they could get some help. You know, I don't know how many billions we've put into the war on drugs and we've never even been able to stop the heroin pipeline coming into Baltimore. And you, know, you look at the record, it's like, you know, arrested, you know, street level users for their uh, privatized prisons, you know, easy customers. That's all that's ever came out of it. Yeah. Yeah, the war on drugs. <laughs> I no, no, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I agree. As far as I said, so yeah, well, I probably, I probably could have made more money if I didn't fish so much <laughs> when I was younger. I was uh-huh. lucky, though. I got into forestry. I was able to mix the two. I, uh, huh. I used to have a reforestation company. We used to do work from uh, New Mexico to Canada, and so I got to work all over the uh, Inner Mountain West. And now uh, we have mm. like, but uh, I don't know. There's really not much I would advise against if I was going to talk to my 25 year old. There you go. So, so, so or, done, or vices, you know. You've done well. You know, I, I don't consider these things vices. I'm really not sure, sure what the definition of a vice is. Yeah, what is the? You know, I think it's all a matter of perspective, right? <laughs> That's true. Oh, well, I like a really good whiskey. Uh, you know, I, cons- I don't consider that a vice. Yeah. I don't sit around and drink it all day long. But, uh, I think the cig smoking is a vice, too. Yeah. I think that's the worst one, really. You know? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I probably wouldn't have got married as young. I probably would have chased women for longer, I think, looking back. I think that might have been fun, but, uh, you know. But I don't have any regrets. I live a pretty good life. Actually, I live a blessed life, really. Yep. Uh, 
I married, uh, I was 20 when I married Doris, who was 21. Wow. My wife's a watercolorist and a gardener. She was amazing, and I didn't even know what I was getting into. I just said, she liked me. <laughs> right? So uh, then about a year into it, I came to the full realization that, man, I had really lucked out and got a good one. Women make life. They make importance. Uh, so... You know, I've been really lucky. Uh, I married a girl that made my life really good, you know, and that allows me to do what I do, likes me for what I do. So it's been pretty easy. I've had a pretty easy ride, Dave. Yeah. Now, if I could just get the indoor plumbing going. Yeah. Yeah, no, you got it. Well, you know, I mean, you've got a you've got a, a, a gal there that, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, unless you did give you, I guess, did give you too much of a hard time on smoking, you know, I mean, so, so, you know, I think that's one of those things where it's, you know, it's your life. You, you did, you know, you've led your life, you know, how you've wanted to lead it, it sounds like. And, and, and you've been happy with that. So that's, that's a good thing. Well, Jim Harrison smoked, Jim Harrison smoked right? You never saw a picture of Jim Harrison where he wasn't smoking. John Gerak smokes. So then he came to fish with me and we sat around when we weren't fishing. We sat around drinking coffee and chain smoking and that was a blast. Uh, so it was really hard for me to quit. And not only that, but every one of them is like an old friend, always there, always comforting, warm, never judging. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I, I remember when John, uh, you know, like I said, John was on the podcast here and I think I asked him that same thing or however we got into it, but he said, you know, he, he used to do, I think, a lot of dr or drugs and, and, and maybe it wasn't drugs. It was more alcohol. Yeah, I guess it was a little bit of both, but he, he quit that, you know, like 30, 40 years ago. But he said, you know, and he quit the, the two things he was never going to quit was uh, was tobacco and coffee. And uh, exactly. I so totally. Yeah. So there's something you guys are on the same wavelength as far as uh, something there. Right. I mean, I think it's something to do with being an artist. I mean, you guys are both writers. There's something about artists and the fact that smoking, I think it probably helps you do what you do. Absolutely. Actually, it's part of the art ritual. If somebody was coming in, of course, nobody can answer this. But if somebody comes to you and says, if you were to quit smoking, say, 20 years ago, and it would give you 10 more years on your life at the end of your life, would you quit? Uh, I'd probably quit for 10. If they said five, eh, I might not. But for 10, yeah, I probably would. Yeah. But then I think willpower has a lot to do with it. I tend to go, I'm aiming for 140, right? So I figure if you aim high, you're going to go longer. You know, you're going to always fall short of that. But I'm going for 140, and I figure that might get me <laughs> to 100. Hey, my Uncle Hank's like in his late 90s, and he just retired last year. Yeah, no, I from, think. It... Uh, you know, he's skied and still, still snowshoeing in his late 90s. I know another person that smokes quite a bit, and I think he's your name might have came up, but uh, but Jeff, you know uh, Jeff, and uh, I'm sure you, Jeff you know, could trail. What's that? I know him. He's a good. Friend. I mean, he's a good friend. Yeah, Jeff. He talked. Your yeah, name. he he manages. Yeah, he manages the evening hatch, uh, the Black Bear Lodge for the evening hatch up here on the Columbia. That's right. And, uh, That's right. That's when we're not. I work and he's up here. We're sitting out on my porch smoking and, and drinking coffee. <laughs> there you go. Coffee again. What is, um, you know, what is something that um, when you think about just people that, that, you know, they see you, what you do, what is something that people get wrong about you? I wonder if we even ever see ourselves uh, the way we really are. Right. I think some people mistake me for a hippie. Ah, <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's good. And you're not a hippie. No, I I don't even know what that is. You but you're know? you're uh, you're pretty I think Ken liberal. Ken buried that. I think hippie's a good. I think hippie's a good word. Oh, good. Well, if it there you go. It's all about again. It's all about perception. Anything new coming up for you? We can expect you. Uh, you know, in the next uh, kind of six months to a year. Yeah, I did. I just finished a book called uh, Trout Spay and the Art of the Swing. And uh, right now I'm looking for a publisher for it. So if I find a publisher for that one, uh, you very might well see it come out. It'll be the first book on Trout Spay. It's got a really extensive uh, 
fly catalog. Oh, cool. Uh, I'd like to find a publisher for it right now. That's what I'm, I'm trying to do. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I'll put a, put a word out to everybody who's listening to this uh, now. And maybe if they know, you know, somebody they can uh, connect, uh, or maybe there's a publisher listening right now that wants to, sounds like an amazing book. I'll uh, throw that out there. So if anybody wants to find you this, the soft tackle journal or uh swing the fly uh, magazine are the best places to track you down. If you're interested in swinging wet flies, uh, subscribe to take out a subscription to swing the fly magazine by far the greatest magazine going, I think in every way it's, uh, art the thing is a piece of art you'll never want to throw it away that's right and who's the editor of that who's running that show williams yeah yeah zach cool all right great 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 yeah i hear great yeah definitely hear all sorts of good his name pops up all the time with good goodness and stuff so uh yeah steve i'm gonna let you get out of here but i just want to say thanks again for uh sharing this is a great conversation i i think if you had our off time air before we're probably close to two hours chatting and i could i could chat for another two with you so maybe i'll get on the river with you they're up on the upper columbia i'd love to get up there someday so i'll uh, check back with you but until then just wanted to say thanks again oh you're welcome dave hey if you want to come fish and get a hold of me and uh we'll go fish sounds great all right all right steve we'll see you soon everybody take care so there you go. If you want to find all the links with all the show notes uh, we covered today, go to wetflyswing.com slash 134. A reminder of the big show, the big podcast, the big event, the big uh, massive thing we have coming that's new and, <laughs> and good. Uh, if you have a business, know somebody that has a business, uh, know an entrepreneur or are an entrepreneur and want to improve your online influence, uh, learn more about online business, how to get things going. I'll be interviewing some of the biggest names uh, on the planet that cover that. So go to wetflyswing.com slash online. Uh, to get more information on the big launch. Thanks again for stopping by the uh, check out the show today. i uh, looking forward to uh, catching up this soon. Hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Hey, y'all. Glad you stuck with me here. Eh? I just wanted to share a little additional bonus content here. Uh, and uh, and Steve's answer for a question that I asked um, about thinking back to his 20 year old self there at the end. So I got Steve back on a call because he wanted to uh, provide a little better answer to leave everybody off with. And I think this is a good one. So um, I wanted to leave in the other one as well, because I think it was a pretty, pretty cool answer, you know, at the same time. So, so here you go. Here's Steve for a quick little answer. If I could go back and speak to my 20-year-old self, I would remind myself to be kind, Uh, give more, practice kindness.